good. All right. So Kim's going to lead us off and do an introduction of our presenters and her presentation also. Great. Thank you very much, David. Uh, so we're very lucky tonight to have uh, two members, two very esteemed members of the uh, U.S. AFWA, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, National Fur Bear Conservation Working Group, uh, Dr. Nathan Roberts and Bryant White. And I'll just give you a little background on both of them. Uh, Bryant White on the right there is uh, currently the Program Manager for Trapping Policy and Human Wildlife Conflicts for the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, an organization that represents all 50 states and brings them together with federal wildlife agencies and non-governmental organizations to enhance fish and wildlife conservation across the country. And Bryant earned his uh, BS and MS degrees in wildlife and fishery science at Tennessee Technological University. He earned a BA at the University of Memphis and a uh, Master of Divinity degree at Harding University. And for the past 20 years, Bryant has coordinated research. And some of you in this room actually participated in this research on the ground uh, up to the development of best management practices for the conservation of fur bearing animals through research, through liaisons with national and international organizations, including the European Union, Russia and Canada, and through education. Bryant's authored multiple popular and peer reviewed publications on wildlife capture techniques, fur bearer conservation, species restoration, and the sustainable use of wildlife. He's actually the lead author on this 2021 prestigious publication in um, the Journal of Wildlife Mon uh, Management, Mo Wildlife Monograph, which outlines the extensive research that's been done for the past 24 years to improve trapping systems. And uh, this, I think, is on our website if anybody wants to take a look at it who hasn't seen it already. It's worth reading. Dr. Nathan Roberts uh, earned a BS and MS degree from the University of Missouri and his PhD from Cornell University, where his dissertation focused on fur bear management in the Northeast. He's worked for several state and federal agencies, including the bear, wolf, and fur bear research scientist at Wisconsin DNR, as a regional biometrician for National Wildlife Refuge System in the Alaska region, as a research assistant at Cornell University, and as a wildlife biologist for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He has published over two dozen scientific articles, including the Best Management Practices publication in the Wildlife Monograph. He's also one of the authors. And Dr. Roberts is currently a professor at the College of the Ozarks and teaches conservation and wildlife management. He's been commissioned to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and has worked for many years as a member of the U.S. Fur Bearer Conservation Technical Working Group. I want to thank them both for giving us their time. I think uh, you'll find these presentations to be very, very interesting. And um, thank you both Nathan and Brian for, for your participation tonight. Appreciate it. So I guess go, uh, you're going to start, Brian. We'll see yeah. if this Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Does everything sound all right? Thank Sounds God, great. yes. Okay. Um, do you want me to share my screen, Chris? I have a presentation. Is that going to work? Yes, please do it. Okay. Let me turn it down just a bit. All right. Are you guys seeing that? Are you? What are you guys seeing on your end? I'm not sure. We can see the. We can see it. Um, okay. If you, could, if you could just expand your screen. Did that work? No, but that's okay. Um, are you guys just seeing my slides or are you seeing the words that I'm going to say or what all are you guys seeing? I can't tell from, from my we, end. It's fine. We just see the presentation. Okay, good deal. All right. Well, then I'll get started. Uh, no further ado. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be with you virtually tonight. I know that all of you are at this meeting because you're interested in wildlife management. You care about wildlife and wildlife populations, and you care about the welfare of wildlife. And so the reason that I was asked to give this presentation is to simply provide you with some information about a lot of research that's been done 
relative to evaluating humaneness when capturing fur bears and traps. And so um, back in 1997, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies started a trap research and education program with the purpose of evaluating trapping devices so that we could use science to improve trapping in a number of different ways, uh, but primarily animal welfare and safety and selectivity, and then encourage through education everyone who uses traps to use the most humane, safe, and selective devices. And we call it the Best Management Practices for Trapping Program, or I'll just refer to it as the BMP program uh, throughout my presentation tonight. And so as Kim mentioned, we published some of our results in wildlife monographs about a year and a half ago. Uh, wildlife monographs is one of the most prestigious peer-reviewed scientific journals in the field of wildlife management. And so I'm going to share some of our uh, results with you this evening. Oops. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties here. All right, there we go. Uh, but before I do get into that, I also wanted to assure you that there's a tremendous amount of support for trapping among the groups who know the most about wildlife management and animal welfare. So the Wildlife Society, you probably know, is the professional society for wildlife biologists. The Wildlife Society supports the use of trapping and wildlife management. They have a very positive standing position statement on trapping. And they actually encourage those engaged in trapping to use traps that have been tested and approved through our BMP program. Also, the American Association of Wildlife Veterinarians is the professional society for wildlife vets. They likewise have a very positive position statement on trapping. Theirs is even specific to foothold traps, and they support the use of those devices. And these are the folks who probably know the most about the welfare of wildlife. Also, the American Veterinary Medical Association, the ABMA, has a positive position statement on trapping. They also encourage anyone using traps to use traps that have been tested and approved through the BMP program. And then also, many institutional animal care and use committees require the use of BMP recommended traps uh, when researchers are capturing wildlife for uh, various research projects. And then, of course, the agency that I work for and that Nathan is also associated with, uh, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, uh, supports trapping and wildlife management, as do all of our member agencies. And that's what I really wanted to highlight here, is that our member agencies support trapping as well. And so, AFWA members include all 50 state fish and wildlife agencies and territorial agencies, all Canadian provincial agencies, and then many federal agencies that manage wildlife and habitats. Uh, you'll probably recognize most of these, but the BLM, NOAA, the National Park Service, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and then U.S. Geological Survey. And then we have about 45 non-government conservation organization members. Um, I'm sure you've heard of some of these, like the American Bird Conservancy, the National Wildlife Federation, the National Audubon Society, the Nature Conservancy, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Ducks Unlimited, those sorts of folks. All these agencies and organizations support the use of trapping in wildlife management. And then, of course, the U.S. public, uh, based on our surveys, supports the use of regulated trapping, and they believe that people should have the freedom to participate in this activity. And so I really just wanted to mention all this to let you know that trapping is very heavily supported. It's supported by wildlife professionals, by the professional veterinary organizations out there, government wildlife agencies, many non-government organizations that work in the conservation field, and even the majority of the American public. And so you might wonder, well, why is there so much support for this activity? Well, because trapping is critical to successful scientific wildlife management. Um, agencies use this tool for a lot of different purposes. I've listed seven of those uses here. Uh, there are probably others that we could come up with, but these are some of the critical activities that agencies engage in that use trapping. And Nathan's going to talk about some of these things a little bit later. Um, but 
there is a tremendous amount of need for trapping. There's a tremendous amount of support for trapping, but it's still a controversial activity, and we all know that. Um, folks are concerned about how animals are treated. Um, can traps be selective? Can we target certain species for capture and avoid others? Uh, are traps safe? Do they, do they pose a risk, perhaps, to pets or the public or endangered species? And so these are issues that are important to the public. They're important to the scientific community. They're important to the trapping community. And we need to be able to address these issues with scientific information, not just anecdotal information. And so that's what we've tried to do through the BMP program. And so when we started the BMP program, uh, we really wanted to look at three different things. We had three objectives that were primary for us. First of all, we wanted to evaluate and improve traps and trapping systems by looking at five different criteria, um, animal welfare, safety, selectivity, efficiency, and practicality. And I'll explain all those as I go through the presentation tonight. We also wanted to enhance the awareness and understanding of modern regulated trapping because we realized that there are a lot of folks out there who really don't understand modern regulated trapping. Um, and then since agencies use trapping for so many good things that are important to conservation and management, uh, we wanted to be able to sustain that activity so agencies could continue to do that. <clears throat> and so, um, as Kim mentioned, I work with the U.S. Fur Bear Conservation Technical Work Group of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Uh, the association has about 60 different standing working groups, committees, and task forces. And so this particular working group focuses on fur bear conservation issues. That group is made up of state, tribal, and federal agency wildlife biologists, uh, university professors, wildlife veterinarians, and then other trapping experts are involved as well. And so we're conducting research uh, on capture techniques and devices for 23 different species. Uh, we have already produced a BMP document for 22 of these, and so you can see wolverine circled there in red. Uh, wolverine is the only species on this list that we don't have a BMP for yet. Um, all of these other species have BMPs out there, and there are numerous trapping devices recommended uh, for their capture. We have done quite a bit of research with wolverines, and we should have uh, a BMP for wolverines pretty soon. And so there is a separate group, a separate ad hoc group for each one of those 23 species uh, of fur bears. And those group participants include, again, you know, different biologists from state, tribal, and federal agencies, wildlife veterinarians, and trapping experts. And we try to bring in the folks who know the very most about that species to participate in these ad hoc groups. So let's talk about uh, the BMP study design for just a minute. How exactly do we develop BMPs? Well, the development of a BMP, it's a pretty intuitive process, I think. Uh, there are BMPs out there for all kinds of things. And so relative to trapping, we use a pretty similar process and approach. Um, the first thing that we did when we started this program and that we continue to do um, is review data about trap performance and use. Uh, that other people have collected and published. Uh, we prioritized the fur bear species and trap types that we wanted to use based on, uh, based on surveys that we conducted of state fish and wildlife agencies, what was most important to them, and then also trappers uh, who participate in regulated trapping programs. Uh, annually, we conduct field projects uh, for the capture of wildlife with different types of traps. We necropsy those captured animals in a laboratory setting um, after we finish those capture projects. We analyze the data that we collect in the field and also in the lab. And then we compare animal welfare, animal welfare performance to an international standard. And I haven't really talked about that standard much yet, but I'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that in just a moment. Um, and then we synthesize all that data uh, and those experiences, and we produce a trapping BMP. And so we're essentially testing all trap types that are used to capture fur bears, whether it's a live restraint system uh, or a lethal system. 
Our field projects um, are conducted regionally based on habitat types, soil types, weather conditions, species prevalence. Uh, we know that those sorts of variables can certainly influence results. Um, and so I'm sure you can imagine that trapping conditions in Vermont uh, are a little bit different than trapping conditions here in Arizona where I live. Uh, and so we have to account for all the variables and nuances that might come into play there. Uh, when I organize one of these projects, I usually find one state from each of two or three regions. Uh, they participate in a single field capture project, and that way we get regional and national results. We usually have two to three trained trapping experts and, and technicians in each state uh, where we're conducting a capture project. Those folks operate under very strict protocols that were developed by the International Organization for Standardization. Um, our traps are checked and animals are removed daily before noon. Uh, those captured animals are dispatched using techniques that are approved by the AVMA or they're released uh, if the trapper decides to do that for some reason. The technician records about 25 different types of data at each trap site each day uh, that are required by the ISO protocol that we operate under. And then the technician ships the animals to the lab for necropsy by veterinary pathologists. And I did want to mention that we conduct our field projects at the state, uh, regional, national level. We run a statistical analysis for every trapper technician team. Uh, we compare the results between those teams to make sure that there are no significant differences between them. And it's really our way of sure, uh, ensuring that there's quality control on the data using standard statistical methods. And so this effectively prevents any individual trapper or technician team from being able to bias the results uh, one way or the other. So experienced wildlife veterinary pathologists perform whole body necropsies on the animals that we capture consistent with those ISO protocols. When we first started this project, uh, Dr. Beth Williams at the University of Wyoming Veterinary Lab did most of the necropsies for animals that were captured in the western United States. And then Dr. Victor Nettles, uh, who was the director of the Southeast Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study at the University of Georgia, did most necropsies on animals that were captured in the eastern United States. And then we also had some animals necropsied at the National Wildlife Research Center in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, we had Dr. Nettles train additional experienced veterinary pathologists in the ISO protocols. And so the vets that we use now are either with universities, federal fish and wildlife agencies, or state fish and wildlife agencies. Um, and we conduct those necropsies every year. When we do that, all the vets that we use are present at the same time. They each work on individual animals. They work together to make sure that they follow those ISO protocols. And then uh, I did want to mention that these are also blind tests. The veterinarians conducting the necropsies have no idea what type of trap was used to capture the animal uh, or even which foot was captured. They simply necropsy that animal. They go over the whole body according to that ISO protocol, and then they find any injuries or any abnormalities and they record those uh, as a part of that process. And so what is a trapping BMP? Hopefully you've seen one of these. Uh, it basically provides some biological information about the species that it covers. It details the trapping devices that meet the BMP criteria. So the devices that we recommend are clearly listed in those BMPs. And then it details techniques of how to best use uh, those approved trapping devices. And what we hope BMPs do is that they simply offer a variety of trapping devices and techniques that can be used by anyone, whether it's a trapper uh, harvesting fur or whether it's a researcher capturing animals to put radio collars on them, whatever, whatever it is they might be doing uh, to capture wild fur bears humanely, safely, selectively, uh, and effectively. And so now I wanna get into the science just a little bit of how we actually evaluate traps so that you understand the kind of what's going on behind the uh, scene with the um, evaluations of these devices. And so first let's talk about animal welfare. 
Uh, the animal welfare criteria that we use was developed by the International Organization for Standardization, or what's usually just referred to as ISO. ISO is the most authoritative standard setting body in the world. Uh, we needed a methodology and a protocol that would be unbiased, and so we worked with ISO to develop something. The U.S. participated in this ISO process through the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI, um, there were numerous other countries that were involved in this ISO process as well. Within the American National Standards Institute, there was a technical advisory group or a TAG that made standards recommendations that was made up of wildlife pathologists, veterinarians, biologists, and other animal experts. And so we came up with a testing protocol. Uh, part five was developed for live capture. Um, that evaluation uses injuries as the criteria because we know that minimizing injuries will facilitate post-capture survival and it will also reduce pain, stress, and suffering during the capture process. And then we also developed a protocol for lethal capture, which is part four of that. It uses time to death as the evaluation criteria or what technically is referred to as irreversible loss of consciousness and sensibility leading to death. And that is measured by the loss of the subconscious reflexes. And so we look at the pupillary light reflex and the corneal blink reflex because those are indicators of brain death. Because we know that the quicker a lethal trap can kill an animal, uh, the more we're going to reduce pain, stress, and suffering for that animal during the capture event. And so let's talk about um, what criteria we use based on that ISO protocol for live capture. So the goal of the standard developed by the International Organization for Standardization is to not compromise the animal's survival so that if an animal is released, it will not be negatively impacted by that event. And that's important because BMPs are used to guide research so a lot of animals are captured and released with radio collars uh, that are attached by agencies. But even if that animal is going to be harvested by a trapper or if it's going to be removed from the population uh, as a human wildlife conflict issue, we want to reduce injury to a minimum because we know that's also going to reduce pain, stress and suffering. And so in order for a trapping device and technique to be recommended through the BMP program, Injuries have to be mild enough to allow certainty that that animal is going to survive uh, if it happens to be released. And so the ISO protocol for restraining traps has two injury evaluation criteria. First of all, there's a cumulative injury scale where each injury that could be caused by a capture event has an associated point score. Uh, the more severe the injury, the higher the score. And then we also break those injuries into trauma categories. It's based on the types of injuries, the number of injuries, and the severity of those injuries. And I'm going to explain those uh, a little bit more so you have a pretty good idea of how that works. Uh, but we look at physical injury because injuries can affect survival post-capture. Uh, injuries can cause stress and pain and suffering. And if we can reduce physical injury, we reduce pain, stress, and suffering. And those who put the ISO protocol together felt that the best way to make that evaluation um, was to look at injuries that were caused to the animal. Hey, hey uh, are you advancing slides? Yes. Are, is it not happening on your end? No, it stopped at slide 23. Okay. Hmm. I'm on slide 29. So what happened there? Anything? Nope. Nope. Okay. Uh, let me try a different way of doing it. It, it might actually be my computer because it's advancing on the phone we're using for audio. Oh, I guess I'll do it manually. Okay. Well, I'm ready for slide 29, Chris. There we go. Okay. Oh. Are we good to go? Should I continue? Working. All right. All right. 
Well, I'll, I'll go until you tell me to stop. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. Back to the cumulative injury scale. Um, this is one of the appendices to that ISO document um, that details trap related injuries that an animal could potentially receive from being live captured. And you'll notice there each injury has an associated point score. And I did some call out boxes so you could kind of see um, because I know that's a little bit hard to read probably in my presentation. So if an animal loses a claw, that's a two point injury. Uh, if it gets a bruise, which we would refer to as edema to swelling or hemorrhage, that's a five point injury. Um, if it gets a joint dislocated below the carpus or tarsus, which is just the ankle uh, on the fore or hind limb, that's a 30 point injury. So we're talking about we dislocate a toe, perhaps. Um, and then we jump all the way to a 50 point injury if we have a compression fracture that's also at or below the carpus or tarsus. So we're talking about uh, a fracture maybe to a toe or something like that. And then if we get a fracture above that ankle bone somewhere, that's a 100 point injury. Uh, that's a pretty severe and unacceptable sort of injury. All right, did you advance the slide, Chris, or is it working now? It, I advanced it. Okay, all right, so we're on 30, slide 30. So. Uh, we also look at uh, these injuries based on trauma scales. Each injury is placed into one of five trauma classes, and you'll notice there are only four classes there, mild, moderate, moderately severe, and severe. Uh, we had to create another class of none uh, because it does happen that about 10% of the animals that we capture have no injuries at all, so we had to come up with a different classification there. Uh, but those mild and moderate injuries should not significantly impair an animal's survival. So those are so, sort of the acceptable injuries. The moderately severe and severe injuries are not acceptable uh, because they can impact survival. So I went to slide 31 there, Chris. So during the necropsy process, each animal receives a score based on that ISO scoring system and based on the injuries it has. And that's why it's a cumulative injury score because every injury gets counted and it gets added up. And so we must have a, a sample of at least 20 animals per trap type per species. So for example, if we're capturing coyotes in a certain trap, we have to have at least 20 coyotes in that specific trap to run our analysis. Uh, we calculate the mean and the 95% confidence intervals uh, for the species and the particular trap type. And that mean cumulative injury score must be less than or equal to 55 points. And then 70% of the animals in the sample cannot have any of the moderately severe or severe injuries. And what we found, however, is that actually 91% of the animals captured in BMP proved traps do not have any of those moderately severe or severe injuries. They either have no injuries or they only have mild or moderate sorts of injuries. So again, an animal with that level of injury should not be negatively impacted by the capture event um, should it be released. And so that's how it works uh, relative to live capture. And then when we get to lethal capture, no. I'm having issues with my slides now. There we go. All right, so when we get to lethal capture, the goal is to essentially kill the animal as quickly as possible, uh, thereby reducing pain, stress, and suffering as a part of that capture process. And so welfare is evaluated with lethal systems as irreversible loss of consciousness and sensibility. And so that state of irreversible lo loss of consciousness and sensibility is determined to have occurred when there's no corneal blink reflex and the pupils no longer respond to light because these are indicators of brain death. And so the animal is not going to lapse back into consciousness. It also has no sensibility at that point. It has no sensation or feeling. Um, that has to occur within 300 seconds 
in at least 70% of the animals in the sample. And again, we have to have a sample of at least 20 animals. And a lot of times our sample sizes are much larger. Um, these parameters, as you might imagine, are too precise to be measured in a field setting. Um, and so uh, animal welfare is evaluated in a lab in a compound setting. All right, and so the other criteria that are not related to animal welfare, um, these sorts of results are calculated from our field data, uh, our technicians collect uh, when they're working with the trappers. And so we wanted to be sure, first of all, that the traps that we recommend are not only humane uh, based on that ISO standard, but that they are actually effective at capturing fur bears. And so the efficiency or capture rate has to be at least 60%. And we measure that by dividing the total number of captures of a target species by the total number of traps that that target species um, actually sprung during that field project. And then we have these final three criteria, selectivity, safety, practicality. There's no ISO standard relative to these criteria. Um, so we use an ad hoc panel of experts to make recommendations based simply on a pass or fail criteria for each device relative to the species that we tested on. So we want to make sure that traps are selective, that there's a way we can set this trap to reduce non-target captures um, and increase target captures. We want to make sure that the traps are safe, that they're not causing a significant risk to the trapper or to the public. And then we just want to make sure that the traps we recommend uh, are field worthy. Um, folks invest a lot of money into these, and so we want to make sure that um, they have a long life and uh, various other factors relative to practicality. So again, we use an ad hoc panel of experts that are biologists and veterinarians and trappers. Uh, we use trappers from the National Trappers Association and the Fur Takers of America uh, to provide comments based on the data and experiences we have. And so now I'll share some of the results. Finally, you're probably I've uh, been hoping I'd get to this point at some <laughs> at some point, uh, but relative to animal welfare, uh, we've tested about 725 different trap types on 23 species of fur bears. Uh, we've necropsied almost 9,000 animals. Um, that those animals came from all five U.S. regions. 41 different states have participated in our capture projects, and we did several of those in Vermont. 41% uh, of the traps that we tested fail those ISO animal welfare standards. And so traps that fail are not recommended through the BMP program. Um, there are numerous trap types that meet those ISO standards for every common species out there. Um, we also know from our surveys of trappers uh, and the trap types that they use that about 80% of fur bears in the US are being captured in traps that meet those BMP and ISO criteria and about 10% are being captured in devices that have not yet been tested. And so we continue to test um, traps on an annual basis. We also know that 99.99% of fur bears were alive in live capture traps or they were dead in lethal traps, which is the goal uh, of a lethal trap. And so that document that's on the left side of the screen, it's one of our science briefs. And it's kind of a little two page document that distills some of the most useful and best information that we've gathered through research. And so this document focuses on our animal welfare results. And I'll show you where you can download that document in a few minutes um, at the end of my slideshow presentation so that you can make copies of that or at least look at it and read it um, if you wanted to do that. Uh, and then relative to safety and selectivity, which are, are two very important things, about 93% of the time when one of our trappers sets a trap to capture a fur bear, that's what they capture. Uh, we didn't capture any endangered species. And again, that's over 500 individual field projects across 41 states in all five U.S. regions. And there were plenty of endangered species out there for us to capture. We didn't capture any human beings. 1.25% uh, of captures were free ranging dogs in live capture systems. None of those dogs required veterinary care, uh, and we didn't have any captures of dogs in lethal sets because there are ways that we can avoid uh, that happening. 
And then 1.9% of our captures were feral or free ranging cats, and only two of those were dead in live capture systems. And again, uh, I wanted to point out these documents on the right side of the screen. They're short, concise documents that distill some of the best information that we've collected on safety and selectivity. And these are documents that are available on our website that you can download and uh, check out if you'd like to do that. And I'll show you where you can find those at the end of our presentation. And so uh, for our next couple of slides, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Nathan Roberts uh, to talk about those. If I can get this to move forward, here we go. I'm going to just right, go ahead and populate this whole slide, Nathan, if that, that way, hopefully we won't run into any issues. All right, Nathan, take it away. All right, thank you, Bryant. Um, can people hear me OK? Yep. All right, very good. Well, thank you, Bryant, um, for that very thorough review of the best management practices. I'll touch just briefly on a few points here related to fur bear management at a broader scale. Um, science based wildlife management and data driven wildlife management has um, because of, of science driven wildlife management. Most fur bear populations are abundant now, and um, I, I wanted to, to caution that there's a difference between the uh, uh, um, abundant and actually seeing them all the time. So we have many species that um, that are elusive, but they are not rare. So uh, in Vermont, for example, bobcats and river otters would be elusive species, but not necessarily rare species. And um, thanks to modern science driven wildlife management fur bear species are abundant in the United States. Um, regulated modern regulated trapping does not cause species to become endangered and you'll see that, that we hit on this term modern and regulated quite a bit and um, hopefully after seeing some of the some of the process that goes into um, evaluating traps you can understand why we draw that distinction between uh, modern trapping versus historic trapping. Um, fur bear management uses trapping and um, fur bear management has been a, a huge conservation success story recognized across the United States and across the globe. Um, we, we often think of trapping as um, simply taking uh, fur bear animals. But trapping is an, an integral part of, of many conservation efforts, including the reintroduction of many animals. So wolves, um, Canada lynx, river otters, where I'm at um, currently in the Midwest, um, the river otters that were used to repopulate the Midwest were captured using modern foothold restraining devices. And uh, many of these species reintroductions just would not be feasible without modern um, capture devices. Trapping is a highly regulated activity. The seasons, the bag limits, the quotas, um, restrictions on where you can set traps, when you can set traps, what types of devices you can use. Um, it, it's a highly regulated process and we have um, have dedicated law enforcement officials that enforce these regulations ac across our country. There are over 8000 wildlife law enforcement agents across our country that make sure that the regulations that we create are enforceable and are enforced. Um, trapping regulations are are based on population data. When we when trapping regulations are set by agencies, they consider the species ecology, they consider safety and welfare of people and animals, and they consider the impacts that those activities might have on wildlife populations, both negative and positive. And um, trapping, like other forms of hunting, requires education and it requires licensing. So you can't just head into the woods with a trap. There's there are many steps that you have to go through before you can do that. And all of this has, has led to trapping for providing many benefits for both the wildlife and, and the public. Um, the use of regulated trapping allows managers to better monitor for bear populations. Given that 
software bear management is so data driven. The more data you have, the better. And there's some data that you just simply cannot obtain without the the use of um, consumptive use of animals. As somebody that um, throughout much of my career helped construct regulations and um, and basing those on science, the information that we get is. is is incredibly important. It allows us to have a constellation of evidence to base these uh, regulations and quotas and seasons off of. Regulated um, trapping helps wildlife managers and agencies that are that are tasked with that to manage populations and their habitats. Allows agencies to undertake um, restoration projects that otherwise would be simply infeasible. It addresses some of the negative impacts that occur occasionally from wildlife so it helps us maximize the positive impacts and minimize the negative impacts and it helps us ensure that fur bear populations are managed sustainably um, not just for the harvest of fur but so that these species can be sustained on the landscape so they can provide um, provide benefits for us um, provide um, ecologic, their ecological role and just a simple intrinsic value that they have on being on the landscape. And um, I, I'll close my part by just saying that fur bear management, when you when you look across the globe, fur bear management in North America is a, is a conservation success story. We do not look to Europe on how to manage river otters or, or other um, types of species we look to, to north america for that and trapping has been an integral port, part of that and so um, separating trapping from fur bear management would be very difficult um, i would say it'd be impossible to do and i by uh, prohibiting trapping i think that you would potentially dismantle um, the some of the components that have led to some of the greatest conservation success stories that we've seen across the globe with that, I'll hand it back to you, Brian. All right. Thank you, Nathan. So I guess to conclude our presentations tonight, um, I just wanted to provide you with these QR codes. You can scan these with the camera of your phone. Um, as I said, we've been conducting research on fur bear since 1997. You can find all the information that I've just shared uh, and much, much more on either one of these websites. Probably the easiest one to remember if you can't access that QR code is simply furbearmanagement.com. Um, so all of that information is there, a wealth uh, of things that Nathan talked about and that I talked about, and you can access all that there. And so um, I guess I'll conclude just by saying thank you again for the opportunity to be with you tonight virtually. Um, I hope we are able to provide some productive information for the process that you're going through there in Vermont. So thank you. Thank you both. We really, really appreciate that. We really appreciate the comprehensive review and we also have many of these resources on our website too at Vermont Fish and Wildlife. So if anybody yeah. wants to look them up, we have the link, I think, to fur bear management as well. So uh, thanks to both of you. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and I hope everybody, we, we aren't going to open it up to questions due to time, but people had papers. They might write the questions on their paper, and we may get back in touch with you folks if uh, we can't answer some of them ourselves. So thanks again. Um, and I assume you're both going to leave. Or you're welcome to sit in on this, but you certainly probably have better things to do and dinner to get to. So <laughs> thanks well, again. Yeah, thank, okay. you, thank, thank you for the opportunity to thank be here. Kim. Thanks all of you. Okay. I know there's at least two people in this room who participated in um, the research effort in Vermont, one as a trapper and one as a field observer. Is there more than that? Anybody else besides the two that I'm aware of? Okay. Because uh, Vermont spent maybe eight, I'm guessing eight years, maybe eight to 10 years, uh, actually doing the, the field part of this, this research effort. Um, we did some research on coyotes, 
uh, for several years and research on Fisher. Uh, Bruce or Mary Beth, do you remember anybody else? Any, anything else that we did? I don't know where either of you are at this minute. But, um, so anyway, uh, very, very comprehensive study. How many of you have, I hope, have heard? Yes. Oh, yeah, Bruce, there you are. They, they took the, they took the, yeah, okay. thank you. Um, yeah, so it was um, a very comprehensive effort and um, we, I hope most of you have heard of the best management practices. Have you? Yeah, good. That was our original goal was originally was to just try to educate and get people to transition that way. All right, so you need to go down. Do you want me to, do you want to run my I machine? Okay, so I'm just going to go very quickly through um, the working group process, how we got to where we are right now, and what our draft recommendations are. And this, I'll just start by saying this is pretty early in the process. There'll be a, probably a whole another year to go where we'll be continuing to gather feedback from people. Um, so you folks here tonight are going to have an opportunity to, to give us your opinions about what we've come up with and we will factor those in we have to a report through the legislature in january and so we wanted to have this public meeting before that report was due um so i'll start i was going to start with what is a fur bearer but i suspect everybody in this room already knows what a fur bearer is um and many of the points that i made in this slide are similar to the ones that that uh brian and nathan just made in that um, all of the species that we currently trap are common and abundant. Uh, we use science-based um, information in order to manage those species, and that regulated trapping is an important tool for managing fur bears in Vermont and across the country. Um, so many of you probably already are aware that last January, or last January, the legislature started to work on Act 159, which passed at the end of the legislative session. And Act 159 basically directed the department to develop regulations to modernize trapping. And those six bullets up there are part of the legislation. Can everybody see them or do you want me to read them? Can you read them from back there? Can you see them back there? You can, okay. Um, and I'm just gonna read you the summary of Act 159 as the legislature wrote it. The act requires the commissioner of fish and wildlife to submit to the general assembly or the legislature recommended best management practices for trapping that propose criteria and equipment designed to modernize trapping and improve the welfare of animals subject to trapping programs. The BMP shall be based on an investigation and research conducted by the Department of Fish and Wildlife and shall use best management practices for trapping in the United States issued by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies as the minimum standard for BMP development. So that's basically the details of that act, this was the summary, those are the details of the, of the act. And we use those details, when I get to talking about the working group, we use those details to, to um, flesh out what kind of, what direction we were going, going to go in, in terms of coming up with recommendations. So go ahead, Chris. So the department decided that um, we would establish a working group to try to get some, some early feedback on what different um, organizations felt we should include in these recommendations. So we had a representative from the Humane Society and representative from the Sportsman's Federation, somebody from the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, somebody from Protect Our Wildlife, from the Vermont Wildlife Coalition, two members of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Board, two members of the Vermont Trappers Association, one representative of the Vermont House and one Vermont Senator and two state game wardens. And if you were on that working group, would you just raise your hand? Some of you are here tonight, not everybody. Um, so I just want to say that we spent, we had four meetings, uh, three hours each, and these people put a lot of volunteer time in to trying to work through this process and provide us with some feedback. And we used the feedback that we got from the members of the working group to develop our recommendations. 
So the goal was um, to provide for the working group was to, to provide input on rules that would regulate the use of foothold trapping systems in accordance with the BMPs as outlined by ACWA. And um, then we were we were told by the legislature that we had to go beyond the basic BMPs and consider other things as listed in the legislation. And so we actually uh, did come up with some recommendations beyond sort of specific BMP type regulations. We also required that the working group or they bought into um, trying to work towards consensus and we had actually um, some ground rules that everybody agreed to and tried very hard to stick to um, in terms of trying to be um, just just trying to be to listen and and consider other people's feelings. Um, and it, you can understand that people who are members of the working group had some very strong feelings about the issue of trapping. So the objectives of the working group was to get the informed consent, as, as I mentioned, and we wanted to, to have a fair and equitable process uh, that the legislature would appreciate that we have gone to the trouble of, of getting feedback from everybody. Uh, we wanted to try to secure some consensus. Um, that was somewhat challenging, but that was a goal at the beginning. And um, we wanted to ensure that the recommendations were clear, practical, efficient, and um, enforceable. So based on those six bullets that you saw, and, and the legislation, your facilitator will have a copy of the legislation if you want to look more closely at those six bullets. But based on those six bullets, the group will <coughs> agree to limit the discussions to those five following topics. So BMPs that would improve animal welfare and selectivity, trail setbacks, baits and lures, technical items relating to body gripping traps, and humane dispatch. And uh, I just want to mention, let me see, I had one thing about that that I was going to bring up. Um, oh, there's one other thing in the legislation that is not, we don't talk about tonight, but we'll include in our report to the legislature the report requires under subsection A uh, that the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife will recommend for funding for funding the replacement of currently authorized trapping devices with trapping devices that are compliant with the recommended BMPs. So that's something else that we are required to do and we will submit with the report. What would it cost to swap out current systems with BMP type systems? So our proposal, and, and you'll notice at the top, the first, first issue is animal welfare and selectivity. And what we tried to do was address the objectives. What were the concerns of either the legislature or the working group members, and how could we develop recommendations that would address those concerns? So the first objective was to improve trapping and trapping systems for animal welfare, selectivity, and safety, as recommended by ACT. And the recommendations there are that all, and I, I was going to go through, I don't think I need to do this with most of you, but I was going to go through what a BMP type trap looks like. I have, we have some with us if you want to see it, but most of you can visualize this. Uh, I believe all base plates must feature a center chain mount with swivels with free moving chains that allow mobility for animals caught. These are the kinds of things that the BMPs recommend. All traps must be adjustable for pan tension. Traps must be anchored with a minimum of 12 inch to a maximum of 18 inch chain. Uh, foothold traps have to be padded, offset, laminated, or have jaws with a minimum thickness of 5 16th. And no foothold trap should be set on land with a spread of more than six and a quarter inches. Okay, that's the animal welfare section. Uh, then the second, the second issue that the working group agreed to discuss was baits and lures. And the objective there was to minimize the capture of non-target animals, particularly birds. Um, and so the language that we are recommending is meat-based bait shall be used in conjunction with trapping. That meat-based bait used in conjunction with trapping shall be covered at the time the trap is set. Covering shall include, but are not limited to, brush, branches, leaves, soil, snow, water, or enclosures constructed of wood, metal, wire, plastic, or natural materials. The third issue that the group agreed to talk about was body gripping traps. 
So the objective here was to minimize any potential for the future capture of domestic pets in body gripping traps set on land. Our recommendation was no meat-based body meat-based baited body gripping traps shall be set on the ground. However, baited body gripping traps with a jaw spread up to and including 60 square inches would have been be up to and including 220s can be used on land in five feet above the ground or within an enclosure with openings no greater than 60 square inches and a trap trigger recess at least 12 inches from all openings. There are no restrictions to body gripping traps, baited or otherwise, if set in the water. And finally, the issue, the last issue, and I, I, I dare say might be the most controversial one, I don't know if you guys would agree with me or not, but um, was hiking or walking trails and public highway offsets. And the objective here was uh, some of the working group members were concerned about the potential capture of domestic pets on public lands um, and children, although we have no historical evidence that children have ever been caught in a trap. Um, and so the recommendation that we came up with was that no trap will be set in a designated walking or hiking trail bed on any public land. No foot traps on or within 25 feet of a traveled portion of a trail on state-owned public land, excluding WMAs, which wildlife management areas, which are funded by um, federal dollars and license dollars for wildlife-based recreation, um, unless it is in the water five feet above the ground. No body gripping traps set 50 feet from a road or trail unless it is in the water or more than five feet off the ground or in a dog proof set. Now the 25 feet, I will say that that we picked that um, for a variety of reasons. One, because there's already a law in place for hunting, you have to be 25 feet off a road or trail. Also, one of the working group members uh, suggested that those retractable dog leashes are about 18 to 20 feet long. So if the dog is on a retractable leash, 25 feet should be enough of a distance to um, maintain, to protect that dog from getting caught in a trap. Um, we agree, the department will agree to develop brochures for kiosks uh, to, just to show people how you might release a dog from a foothold trap or a, a body gripping trap. And we will recommend that any changes to the regulations will get added to um, our trap red program. So I think that is, those are, oh, humane dispatch. This was another issue that uh, was in the legislative bill. Uh, the group unanimously agreed that we would put off any discussions about humane dispatch uh, until the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, came out with a national recommendation, which they're working on. It could take a while, but um, if, if they come out with a recommendation within the year that we're trying to develop regulations through the board process, we would include that in this process. If not, we've committed to opening back the rule um, after the fact. So um, we just felt like we shouldn't be developing that on our own without some some better, some people who had a better knowledge of what would be appropriate. Um, so that's, that is the end. And I think our next steps, you wanna, we can go back up to the, go back yeah. up to the agenda. Yeah. Right. So next, uh, what we'd like to do is we're gonna break into our, our working groups. And I counted up, there's about 47, 48 of us. So we'd like to break into eight groups of six. And then the facilitators will work with you at that table. You know, right now, where you're thinking about it, you have that second sheet that you can write down questions on the presentations that we can answer later on or answer online. But we're going to go through the first two questions, give you five minutes to write down your uh, thoughts about those, and then talk about them as a group for 10 minutes. And then we're going to move on to the next three questions, give you another 10 minutes to write down thoughts on those, and then have a discussion for about 20 minutes and, and work through that and then we'll wrap it up at the end. So most of the tables, if you can get eight tables with about six people each, that'll work out well and then we'll get a facilitator to you. 